just um, wanted to let you know, if you haven't heard already, uh, our sister, our fellow soldier in the Lord has gone to be with the Lord. She passed away early this morning, Rochelle Coker. Um, just this past week was just a battle. It, it was talking to someone first service after first service. You know, she was just with us with her girls at, at sushi dinner Christmas Eve. And here we are, what, four weeks later, and, and she is, um, I say, you know, we, we, we mourn as those who have hope. There's the good news. Like, when I, we, I, I want to thank my leadership team. We went to the ICU this week several times. We prayed with her, even though she wasn't able to communicate herself. Uh, there was enough eye opening and nodding and just wanting to pray and hear the word and just have loved ones around her. Um, she, she was a fighter. I love, I love Rochelle so much. Um, she's a fighter. Good news is the fight's over. No more pain. No more sorrow. No more difficulties. Uh, she knows Jesus better than any of us know him right now. You know? And I think Parker's going like, you guys are missing out. You guys are missing out. So stay tuned for uh, memorial service information, celebration of life information. I'm going to talk to her daughters. Be praying for Brandy. Be praying for Autumn. Be praying for friends who don't know Jesus. Um, pray that somehow God will take her life and her situation and turn it into a way that glorifies him and expands the gospel. So uh, we'll keep you posted on that. And then on another note, this has been, this has been a, a season of loss and grieving for our church community. Appreciate you praying for me and the leadership. Uh, Jack Hayes. Passed away a week and a half ago, met with the family. His memorial is next Sunday here at 1 o'clock. So uh, if you want to come remember Jack and be with his family, next Sunday here at 1, is, that's where we're going to be. So um, I'm going to have uh, one of our deacons, Hannah. Hannah, would you stand up and just pray for these families, for these loved ones, just during the season of just difficulty? And um, Thank you. Amen, amen. So it's interesting. Uh, I had met Rochelle. I know this is going to sound super spiritual. I uh, met her at poker. Um, I'm going to tell you right now, Rochelle was an amazing poker player. Uh, and I, I, I did not look forward to sitting at the same table with her playing poker. She's actually playing poker with Jesus right now, maybe even beating him a little bit. I don't know. Um, she, was, she was tough and uh, so skilled and so intimidating and uh, – you know, as much as she was a great poker player, and I met her probably 10, 12 years ago, and she found out I was a pastor, and she wanted to talk about spiritual things, and she came to be a part of the Missio community, and I'm going to tell you the growth in her over the past few years, and even when she was diagnosed with this cancer, and she just pressed in to her Lord and just deepened her faith, and I mean, there's something to learn for us uh, from that, and I can say the same thing with Jack Hayes. 84-year-old guy who literally, you open his veins, espresso would shoot out of his veins. He was always at the bar drinking two shots of espresso and just uh, talking about, you know, conspiracy theories and politics, but bringing the conversation back to Jesus. Because really, let's just be honest, there's nothing better to talk about than, than Jesus. And, and any conversation, whether we're talking about poker or politics, can come back to Jesus. So there's the, there's the creativity involved. But God wants us to remember two things as we even think about their stories and this is for Rochelle, and this is for Jack, how he grows us and how he guides us. And that's what we're going to see in Acts 16. Turn your Bibles there if you would. Um, we're gonna, I, I encourage you to take some notes. There's some really good practical stuff here. It may feel a little different 
uh, than a typical message. I mean, there's going to be there's going to be exposition. There's going to be truth. But I really want to give you some tangible things you can walk out of here with on the topic of growth and guidance. And I'm and and I think here's the million dollar question, right? Is like, what is God's will? How do we make decisions for the glory of God? How do we allow God to speak into our lives and influence our steps? I mean, some of us are bound to have some tough choices this week or some important choices this week. Relationships, job, finances, who knows? All of us want wisdom, right, to, to make the best choices possible. Uh, but God is not going to guide you without growing you. And I think that's an important thing to, to think about as we look at Acts 16, which is a very interesting text, and there's, and there's really two points this morning. So let's read the passage, and then I want to kind of tease it a little bit to, to pull out some relevant truth for us today. So Acts 16, we're going to look at verses 1 through 10. And if you remember last week, we talked about the disagreement that happened between Paul and Barnabas over the, uh, the young man disciple named John Mark, and one wanted to take him, uh, even though he had kind of failed them early on in ministry, and give him grace, show him grace, and Paul was adamant, saying, no, we need someone stronger, mo- more committed, and so they couldn't have come to an agreement. They were both acting like, excuse me, but jerks, and they went their separate ways, and God in his sovereignty said, I'll use it. <laughs> Instead of being one team, we'll take two teams, and so Barnabas takes John Mark, and then Paul teams up with a guy named Silas, Here we pick up the narrative again, verse 1, chapter 16. And he came, Paul, came to Derbe and Lystra. Behold, a certain disciple was there named Timothy. Circle the word Timothy. Important character in the early church. The son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. And we have this idea that perhaps his dad has passed away. So he's primarily raised by his mom and grandmother. We'll talk about that here in a bit. And he was well spoken of by the brethren, which is pretty cool, who were not only in his hometown Lystra, but also Iconium. His reputation went beyond even the city he lived in. Paul wanted this man to go with him on his journey. So he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those parts. And they all knew that his father was a Greek. Now that is a tough call right there. That's a tough decision to make. I mean, Paul, I wish you would have told me what the, uh, the requirements were ahead of time, right? But we'll talk about why the circumcision was important. Uh, now, while they were passing through the cities, they were delivering the decrees which had been decided upon by the apostles and elders who were in Jerusalem for them to observe. So the churches were being strengthened in the faith and increasing in number daily. That's good. So circle the word strengthen. Circle the word um, uh, increasing, right? So important. God will, he's, he's not concerned about numerical growth as he is about spiritual growth, right? Someone pastor once told me, you know what, Scott, you take care of the depth of, of people and God will take care of the breadth of, of people. And I like that a lot. So um, verse six, and they passed through the Phrygian and Galatian region, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak a word in Asia. And when they had come to Mysia, they were trying to get into Bithynia and the spirit of Jesus did not permit them. So you have the spirit, third member of the Trinity, the spirit of Jesus, second member of the Trinity. Passing by Mysia, they came down to Troas. And there a vision appeared to Paul in in the night. A certain man of Macedonia was standing and appealing to him, saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. Interesting. And when he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that God, the first member of the Trinity, has called us to preach the gospel to them. May God write his eternal truths upon our hearts this morning. So two main points. Uh, As I promised early on, first one, dealing with growth uh, through unexpected decisions, and the second one, dealing with guidance through unexpected directions or hindrances. So back to the first one. Let's look at this because uh, we're going to spend about 25% of our time on this, but 75% of our time talking about uh, guidance and, and God's direction in our lives. So look at the passage again, if you would. So Paul takes Silas, and they're going to revisit the cities that they had planted churches in five years prior. So it's been five years. And Paul's heart is to say, how are these churches doing? 
How are they growing? How can I strengthen them? What a heart, right? And if we look at a map, and we're going to refer to this map a couple times, this is the nerd part of me. This is the historian part of me. But I think it's good to get a visual of, of what we're talking about here. So on the first missionary journey that Paul and Barnabas went on, they launched out from Antioch over to Cyprus and up this way and planted churches in Pisidia, Iconium, and Derbe. Now Paul and Silas reverse the route. And they're going back this direction. And what is amazing, and, and what a heart, not only of, of love for the church, but courage, he goes back to the very city that he was stoned and left for dead in. Now, what compels a person to go back to the people that hated him and wanted him dead? The love of Christ compels you to do this. And so he takes Silas with him. And they have this little entourage, and they're going back, and they're going to strengthen the churches, and they go back to the very city that had left him for dead. Now, imagine being a believer in that city. So Paul leaves, and this is five years later. The church is, has been established. It's growing. And we meet one of the key believers in that city, and his name's Timothy. Now, you need to know about Timothy. Timothy is, we're going to call him a rock star for, for Jesus. Timothy is this young man who had heard the gospel from his mom and grandma. They, they shared the scriptures with him at an early age. When Paul came to town the first time, his gr mom and grandma came to know Jesus. And then since then, Timothy has come to know the Lord, which tells me something about moms and grandmas. They can be incredibly influential. Never es underestimate the power and love of a mom or a grandma. Amen? Ladies, let me just, I'll just speak for the dudes. You guys are just a little bit more dialed in to God than we are, all right? You're a little bit more spiritually intuitive than we are, and, and I just want you to know that your impact and your influence upon your children and grandchildren cannot be measured, appreciated enough. But here's what we have to also have to realize is that, uh, and sometimes this parent guilt feel, sets in. Has everyone ever felt parent guilt when it comes to your children maybe not doing the things that you had taught them and raised them to, to do, you know? Uh, so, so many uh, people in this church community have children who they're adults now and they've just kind of maybe wandered from the faith or God is just not an interest anymore. Here's what you don't give up on. Don't give up on praying for them. Don't give up. While they have life and breath, there's an opportunity for God to grip their heart and that's the work that only God can do. You can teach, and you can instruct, and you can influence, but only God can change the heart. Amen? And so we see this young man, Timothy, who is fatherless. His dad was a Greek. This is why he wasn't circumcised. His dad did not want his son circumcised. He was a Greek, probably a Roman soldier, meets this young Jewish woman by the name of Lois. They hook up, have a baby, right? But Lois was determined to share the truth of God from what she had in the Old Testament with her, her son, Timothy. And then Eunice came along as the grandma and also kind of doubled down on that as well. Matter of fact, you can write these passages down. Look how beautiful this scene is, right, between Timothy, Lois, Eunice. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5 says, I reminded you. So this is Paul writing to Timothy. Paul writes two letters to Timothy that we have in our scriptures. Because Timothy becomes a pastor. Timothy becomes a pastor of this area, and t Paul is so excited for this young man and his call to ministry that they spend the rest of their lives ministering with one another, and they develop like this father-son relationship. I praise God for the Paul-Timothy relationships I've had in my life. I've sought men out who have been Paul to me, and I know young men have sought me out to be a Paul to them, and we need that, right? Even, even the letter, Timothy talks about the older men in, in invest in the lives of the younger men, and older women invest in the lives of the younger women. That's our responsibility as a church community, amen? So we see this. I'm reminded of your sincere faith. He's, Paul's writing to Timothy. A faith that dwelt first in your grandmother, Lois, and your mother, Eunice, and now I am sure dwells in you as well. Right? Paul is quick to commend these women. Thank you for loving your son and grandson. Thank you for investing in him. And then later on in Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, he'll write these words, And how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. So all these women did was share with them the truth of God's word, guide their son, grandson in the ways he... He should, he should live, and then God took over and changed his life. That's not a guarantee. 
that, that any of our kids would come to know Jesus. I pray my three children would come to know the Lord and grow in him. And, you know, they've evidenced it a little of that. But you know what? God is sovereign. He's more sovereign than I am. And uh, just to, you know, I'm humbled by even just to make their beds. I mean, that, there's no control there whatsoever. But God is able to save your children beyond anything we're able to do or accomplish. Amen, church? So Paul says, I want Timothy, which is the first. If you want to grow, you need the right people in your lives, right? If you want to do something just bonkers for the kingdom, you need the right people in your lives. Matter of fact, here are going to be the three blanks that we're going to navigate through really quick. You need the right people who have the right priorities with the right passions. We see this in Timothy. So the first is the right people. So you have this community, right, Lystra, who's got these women, Lois and Eunice. I mean, they are like pillars in the church. They've got this son who has this reputation named Timothy, grandson, who's got this reputation not only in his town but beyond. And Paul says, I want you to join me. I want you to join. He's quick to pick up on Timothy, yet he wasn't so uh, high on getting John Mark to join him on the, on the, on the tour, right? Why? Because he, he felt like John Mark hadn't reached that point of maturity yet. That's okay. Maturity would happen, but he sees the maturity in Timothy and says, Timothy, I want you on board. He's got a good reputation. That's what the verse says, right? Can you write down that word reputation? And I, and I want to say a word about this because um, reputation is different than character. And we need to be careful because while a reputation may be good, character's better. Reputation is what others think about you. Character is what God knows about you. And we need to keep that right because your character, I believe, should feed your reputation. We do not seek a reputation, even though we live in a culture that seems so fixated about reputation. Social media, likes, followers, this, that. We know how re reputations can rise and we know how reputations can fall. Here's the good news. Character is that constant that God's got because that's who you are when the lights are off and no one's looking. It's just you and God. So be careful about a reputation. Let that reputation flow from the person that is unseen in what God is forming in you. Reputation is what comes out of you. Amen? So be who God wants you to be in him, right? So... These are men and women, Lois, Eunice, Timothy. I could tell you right now, there's, I think there's three qualities about them that are phenomenal. They are spiritually fruitful people. They are morally faithful people. They are culturally flexible people. When, you, when you're thinking about, man, who do I want to journey through life with? Who do I want to partner up with and, and maybe share Jesus with and go on a trip and, and spread the, the, the glory and fame of Jesus? You want three, these three qualities in the people you're ministering with. Write them down. These are really good. Spiritually fruitful, s morally faithful, culturally flexible. And it's that last point that really, like with Timothy, it's like phew, huge. What do we mean by spiritually fruitful? Meaning the fruit of the Spirit are growing in their lives. Galatians chapter 5. They're growing in love, peace, patience, joy, gentleness, self-control, all that. Morally faithful, meaning these are people that want to, my calling in Christ compels me to walk in a manner worthy of that calling in Christ Jesus. Right? Morals and ethics are important. Not that we're believing in this morally therapeutic dea uh, deity, right, that just concerned about behavior, but my beliefs lead into my behavior, and I want to honor God in my life and my conduct. And then third, culturally flexible, meaning while I may have a message that is unchangeable, my methodology must change. There are going to be different contexts, different conversations, different types of people, and I have to be quick to adapt, right, to that context. Even though I'm not going to change my message, my approach may look different from person to person to person. That's where we get to point number two, the right priorities, because Paul is moved by Timothy, the fact that he would want to get circumcised to, to, to share the gospel to the Jews, Talk about pr priorities. Priorities change for all of us, right? There's priorities that are constantly modified and revisited, and a wise leader knows how and when to apply the principles of the Word of God, when to stand firm, when to yield. We see this with the topic of circumcision. 
And, and you would think by reading this passage that Paul is a hypocrite because of his position on circumcision that we just read in the previous two chapters. Why would he encourage Timothy to get circumcised when just a couple chapters prior, he says circumcision is not important when it comes to salvation? Is he talking out both sides of his mouth? No, this is about a man who's able to adjust his priorities. See, the problem with circumcision, as it's already been brought up in Acts, is that there was a group requiring you to be circumcised to be saved. Even with Titus, who in Galatians chapter 2, Paul addresses, Titus is a Greek, and they were telling him, you have to be saved. The moment someone tells you you have to do something, you need to just question that. Right? You have to question that. Timothy wasn't forced, he had a choice, and he willingly embraced the choice. This is not a matter of salvation. This is a matter of service. This is not a matter of salvation. This is a matter of strategy. This is not a matter of salvation. This is a matter of sacrifice. He's willing to endure as a grown man circumcision so someone comes to know Jesus. Come on now, you guys. What are you willing to suffer? What are you willing to sacrifice? What pain are you willing to endure so that someone could hear the name Jesus? I think that's a valid question, which leads us to passions, the right passions. Because this is complicated. But yet, it really lives out what Paul wrote to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. We don't have that, I don't think we have that passage, but it's okay. To the Jew, I'm going to become a Jew. To the Gentile, I'm going to become a Gentile. I will become all things to all people so that I might be able to save some. Like, that's passion. The fact that you're willing to undergo something uncomfortable. Embrace some sort of deficiency, some sort of pain, whatever you're willing to embrace in order for someone to hear the gospel. Are you kidding me? That's the kind of passion of people I want. And I think that only confirmed Timothy's place on Paul's team. The right people, the right priorities, with the right passion. You think God's going to use these guys? You better believe it. So God will grow us using those three, three things, right people, right priorities, right passion. And when he starts growing you and, and moving through you and growing his church, which is ultimately what God is going to do, the, the, the gates of hell will not stand against the work that God is doing even today. Isn't it great to be a part of something that will not fail? I think about that. Like, I do not worry. Why? Because this is not my deal. This is not my project. This is not my kingdom. Jesus said, I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell will not stand against it. It is an amazing thing to be a part of something that will not fail. I was just talking to someone between services. Their company just continues to tank and tank and tank. And we sit there and go, nothing is ever permanent when it comes to the things of this world. Right? Like, all of us, we don't like change. The older we get, we don't like change. Like, man, that, my favorite Mexican food place is no longer there. Or if it's still there, they changed the menu and they took my favorite item off the menu, right? And we become these, these old curmudgeon type people who lose sleep because your favorite burrito is not offered at your favorite Mexican food restaurant anymore. You know, but things change and, and companies come and companies go and governments rise and governments get destroyed. And it just reminds us that there's nothing on, the, on this earth that you should put your security And the kingdom will last. And I just love the fact that we are part of something that will not fail. But how do we operate within this realm of God's kingdom? Point number two, God's guidance through unexpected direction. So so Paul's faced with all these decisions. He picks the right people. He rearranges the right priorities. He he embraces the right passions. But here's the topic right here. How does God guide us? How did God guide him when it came to choosing Timothy? How did God guide him as far as the next city they needed to go to? How does God open doors? How does God close doors? Because we see this. This is a really fascinating passage. If you look at Acts 16, you're going, the Holy Spirit forbid them to go into Asia. The Spirit of Jesus didn't permit them to go into Bithynia. But yet God called them over to Macedonia. 
here's the amazing thing is Macedonia wasn't even on Paul's radar, but it eventually got on his radar because this is the way God works. He's a God who opens and closes doors. And let me just be forthright with you guys because we're more apt to think God opens doors than he closes doors. We don't like the idea of God closing doors, but let me just tell you, sometimes the closing of doors is what's best for us. Let me remind you of a verse from Revelation chapter 3, verse 7 and 8. This is descriptive of Jesus. Notice what is being said here of Jesus. And this not only pertains to the church at Philadelphia, this pertains to the character and work of Jesus. To the angel of the church at Philadelphia, right, the words of the Holy One, the true one who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens. I know your works. Behold, I've set before you an open door which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. So here's what is, is being spoken of about Jesus, is that he has the power to open whatever door he wants, and no one will close that door, and he has the power to shut doors, and no one will be able to open them. I think some of us have probably exerted a lot of energy trying to open doors that he's closed. And we've exerted a lot of energy of trying to open doors that he's shut. Did I just say that? Probably. (laughs) You guys know what I mean, right? Not enough coffee, more espresso now, right now. So we have this God who says, I want you to know my will. I want you to understand my heart But there's going to be this little bit of mystery involved in discerning what that is and what that looks like. And hopefully this morning, I want to give you some really practical suggestions in in your journey where God has you today, where God wants to take you tomorrow, how he wants to direct your steps. Because here's what I see with Paul and, and this team is that one of the things that we have to remember is that Paul was an idol. He wasn't just sitting at home binge-watching the latest, you know, uh, zombie series on Hulu or whatever. Like, all right, God, whenever you're ready to speak, I'm here. He, He was already just doing things for Jesus. And let me just tell you, God has an easier time directing your steps when you're not idle, but when you're active for him. So here's what happened. Let's go back to the map, and I want to show you, just visualize this. So here he goes. He goes to Lystra, Iconium. He picks up Timothy. And then they start moving, and they want to go into Asia, which is to up and to the, the right. But they kept hitting something. We don't know what it is. It's a mystery. It's not listed for us. Like, was it the fact that, you know, maybe Paul got sick, and that was their indication, like, we shouldn't go there? Or was there, was there a little bit of conflict among the team, and that prevented them from going there? Or maybe there was literally, like, rabid wolves blocking their way? I don't know. But it was interesting because they wanted to go that way, but they kept hitting a wall. But that wall was really the hands of God really guiding them to where they needed to go. Like, I've done this with my, I remember with my own kids, like, when they're little and they're starting to crawl, like, you don't want them to go a certain way, but you want them, to, and so you kind of hem them in a little bit, and though they have this freedom of their will to move, you as a greater force are forcing them to go a direction you want them to go, and this is exactly what God's doing. He's, he's saying, nope, you're not going to go there, so he kind of presses them this way, and they want to go up into Bithynia, and God says, nope, you're not going to go there, and eventually they end up at Troas which is right across the Aegean Sea from Macedonia. And there in Troas, he gets the vision. And the Macedonian man says, come over here, we need your help. Now let me just say something really, really important at this point. Paul, Timothy, could have forced their way probably into Asia. Bithynia, but God would not have blessed that. They were sensitive to the Spirit's prompting and leading and whatever whatever signs they had. And here's what I have to say, and I love this. Someone once said this. Better to be in Troas with God than in Asia without him. There had been times we probably fight for what we want, and God goes, You want what you want, you can have it, but I'm not going to be involved in it. Let me say it another way. It is better to go to where you didn't plan to go with God 
than where you plan to go without him. Which means what? You and I better be quick to readjust what we think we want. And for some of us, this is a hard message. Some of us think the spiritual gift is stubbornness and hard-headedness and uh, this determination that is not necessarily a bad quality, but when it comes to you and God wrestling, it's not healthy. And I think what Paul has learned in his years in Christ is, I don't know where God's going to take me, but I'm going to recognize the open doors as God's blessing, and I'm going to recognize the closed doors as God's blessing. And the former is a lot easier than the latter, isn't it? And here's what I love about the spirit and attitude of Paul. He doesn't, like, get all stubborn and butthurt. Write down that phrase, butthurt. <laughs> Too many of us get butthurt because, oh, this is what I wanted. You're, you're forgetting about a, 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 the, the biggest aspect of the way God works. He is sovereign. He is in control. He knows things better than you know them. And you, knowing this, this small little bit of information about how things work and things about your lives and things that are going to happen tomorrow, shouldn't we just trust him? Because let me just tell you, you should celebrate where you're at, whether it was your plan or not. Because God is sovereign. And so here's Paul. We don't sense this stubbornness. We don't sense this, argument, this argumentation from him. He is obedient. He is surrendered. And, and he doesn't see God's denials as God's way of saying, I don't love you. Sometimes the best thing God can do for us is deny us something we really want. Because I have a feeling those things that we really want, we want at the expense of wanting him. And we should be careful. And so we, we talk about God's will. We talk about this. How do we discern things, right? All I know is look, if you look at verse 10, right, it says, once they got to Troas, God gave them this vision. And then that vision was a man, right? So it was almost like all those little detours and all those closed doors got them to a place where now they receive God's blessing. What is it? It's a vision. Macedonian man says, come on over. We need you. And then in verse 10, when we had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go into Macedonia. Immediately. Meaning when God wants you to do something, act quickly because delayed obedience is always tantamount to disobedience. Act immediately and watch what God's going to do. Concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel there. It's not that God didn't want the gospel in Asia. He'll get the gospel to Asia. He wants it in Europe. And because of Paul and his team's faithfulness to be sensitive to the Spirit's leading, the gospel is now planted in Europe in which many of us are now the recipients of that faithful work. If you think about it, pretty amazing. But let me stop and I want to just talk about three things real quick. That How do we personalize what, what's kind of going on here? What about decisions in our lives? How do we recognize open doors? How do we rec recognize closed doors? How does God direct our steps? Three things I want to talk about. And it's not about God's will. It's really about God's heart. Because here's what I think happens, and it happens to me and it happens to you. When we start asking questions about God's will, it turns into this transactional conversation when God doesn't want that. He wants relational conversation. Matter of fact, write down those two words. Transactional, relational. How many of us have come up with our script and our list and we go to God and it's like, hey God, bless this. This is what I want. And, and God's going, you know what, if you're going to just treat me as this big slot machine in the sky that you're going to put something in and pull the handle and hopefully get something out, this, I'm, I'm not the God for you. Because as much as I would love to give you what you want, I want you to more importantly know that it's your heart that I want. See, this is where a relationship comes in, and there's three things concerning this relationship that I think, I hope and pray will impact all of us when it comes to decision-making, when it comes to discerning what the, the heart of God is, what his will is. Three things, and we'll start with this one. You are called by conversion. See, you have to understand something amazing about God in that 
I mean, if, if, if we're being honest, too many of us live our lives relying probably on something similar to this. And if, and if you've been around for a little bit, you know what this is. It's called the Magic 8-Ball. And, uh, boy, this is, this is this has helped me make every decision in my life. You think I'm kidding, don't you? No, I, I mean, let's just put let's just put this. Let's be honest. Some of us just kind of approach life, and whether it be the magic eight ball or flip a coin or whatever, we just kind of do things um, willy nilly, off this whim, off the cuff, right? And we just don't really think about why our decisions, what they reflect, what's more important in our decision making. Let's just test this out and let's see how. What, what sort of yes or no question do you have for the magic eight ball today? Let's determine our. Well, you know what? Someone said that first service, too. You don't know what it said. It said most definitely so. Let's see. Let's see if the magic eight ball is consistent. Will the Cowboys win against Tom Brady tomorrow night, who is 7-0 against the Cowboys? Most definitely. <laughs> Should we just go home? Like, all is well with the universe now, because magic eight ball said the Cowboys would win. Now, if the Cowboys lose, should we just chuck this thing out in Alma School and just... What other yes or no questions do we have? Come on. Don't be shy. You got something? Outlook good. All right. Woohoo. All right. One, of, one other question over here. Someone got a question for the Magic 8 Ball. All right. Marsha. Oh, let's see. Ask again later. Hey, it's what that you ball said, right? I mean, if we're honest, like, if we're not using the magic eight ball, you know, some of us, we're in the horoscopes or we're in the astrological forecasts or fortune tellers or who knows what sort of weird, mystical, magical. Let me just tell you, stop. You have a father who loves you, who invites you into relationship and says, let me make the journey a little easier for you. I have called you by conversion. What do we mean by that? Write down 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 1, chapter 2, uh, yeah, chapter 1, verse 22, 24. He says the, the Jews seek a sign. Gentiles seek wisdom. But you who are in Christ Jesus have been called to Christ the power and wisdom of God. Here are the titles of your Savior, the power and wisdom of God. You've been called into this relationship. You've been saved and brought from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. You've been saved and brought from death to life. Here's the amazing thing, ladies and gentlemen. If you're in Christ and you've been born again, you've been born again to a living hope whose guaranteed future is, is as sure as Christ has risen from the dead. Can I, can, and, and let me just say, for the unsaved person, they don't have this hope. For the unsaved person, they're making decisions as best as they can, but there's no guarantee that, that their life is going to be destined for something positive. You have to be saved to know the heart of God. This is why the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ is so important. And, and let me give you just a couple rules under this point. There's going to be eight rules total, uh, but two, two rules under this first point, rule one, rule two, and they're one word, rules. Rule number one, control. But it's not your control, it's God's control. Here's what you need to be reminded of no matter what. You have nothing to fear, oh little flock, because have you forgot that the Father promises to give you the kingdom? Luke, I think it's chapter 7, could be wrong, but it's in Luke. Do you not know, little flock, that the father, <laughs> is, that, is that my medication alert? What do I need to take? So, some sort of cream or something? I don't know. I, God is in control. Let me just remind you, you've been called to God by conversion, and now you find yourself in a tough place. Here's what you need to recognize, that either God has put you here or he's allowed you to be where you're at for reasons known perhaps only to himself. This is when we speak of the sovereignty of God, is that whatever happens in life, do you not think God is aware that he knows and that he's going to work all things out according to those 
who love him for his glory. And that's the second word, glory. God is working. He's a prime mover in our universe, in our lives, all with one goal, for him to be glorified. You have been called by conversion to know that this is a God who's moved heaven and earth to save you. Here's a God who has saved you so that he could be glorified. So those are first two rules when it comes to discerning what God wants for your life. You've been saved to recognize God is in control of all things. And you've been saved so that God gets glory in all things. Point number two. Now we're going to get a little bit more practical. Point number two. You're called into covenant. God has saved you and brought you now into a covenant relationship. Now this is a word that's it's really lost today. We don't use the word covenant in our conversations. What we have substituted it as far as covenant is the word contract. And there's a vast difference between covenant and contract. You want to know what it is? Covenant is lifelong and never to be broken. Contract could last 90 days and then we can rip it up and throw it out. Aren't you glad God doesn't enter a contract with us? Because I'll tell you what, two minutes into that contract, God would have bailed on me like that. Like, really? This is, this is the relationship? I'm not into this. I'm gone. We treat too many important covenant relationships like contract relationships. I know people who have come to God and they've left God because he hasn't given them what they wanted. I've known people who have entered other covenant relationships, marriage, uh, with the same kind of mentality, right? There, not everything is a covenant relationship which we're going to see in the third point. But when it comes to those covenant relationships, namely the most important one between you and your maker, he's called you into this relationship and he's asking for you to be fully surrendered to what he wants to do in this relationship. And I, and I really, you want to, uh, there's a psalm I want to share with you guys. And when I first read it a couple days ago, it's just really kind of just, it's been there. It's been like that, that sense of, yeah, I needed to hear this. Psalm 131, check this out, verses 1 and 2. Look what the psalmist says. I love the beauty that's, that's listed. Oh, Lord, my heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great or too marvelous for me. Here's what, here's what he's saying. There are things that could cause me a lot of anxiety. A lot of stress. There's a lot of uncertainty. I, I don't want to be prideful, right, where I lift my heart too high. I don't want to raise my eyes too high, perhaps beyond you. I want to recognize you in, in the normal, everyday affairs of my life. I, I don't want to occupy myself with things that are beyond me, right? And how many of us need to hear that word, right? Like, that just adds stress and anxiety. But look what he says. But I have calmed and quieted my soul. Like a weaned child with its mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me. What you hear is this sense of, I need to be surrendered to my father who puts a premium on his relationship as daddy to his child. I need to be surrendered as much as I want to know, what about this relationship? What about this job? What about my finances? What about my, all these what abouts, what abouts, what abouts? God says, I don't want you to think about the whatabouts. I want you to think about the who that's most important to you. And it's me. We need to hear this. You have been saved for relationship. He's entered a covenant with you, which he promises he'll never leave us or forsake us. He's a God who wants to make his glory known in this relationship now. He wants to remind you he's in control. And, there, and there's four rules under this point that I want to give you. Again, one word. Rule number three enemy because here's what we we recognize is that there is an acknowledge we acknowledge an enemy who wants to rob us of our joy who wants to steal that that hopefulness from us but we also recognize that we have to keep our eyes on Christ he who is in you is greater than he who's in the world. Amen? Amen? The key is not to be distracted. See, when it comes to covenant, we need to be reminded of the God who makes this covenant. 
who creates us this clean heart, right? Who, who's changed the heart of stone into a heart of flesh, who's got us forever. He doesn't want us to be fixated with the enemy. Too many people are fixated with what's not working and what's frustrating, what's discouraging, and you need to focus on what is glorious and what is hopeful and what causes that, that certain attitude within you that God's got me, right? And that can come via n- rule number four, the word, You will not understand the heart of God until you find yourself in the word of God. Matter of fact, let me say it this way, and I I really like this, is this idea of, am I resting in God's sovereignty, or am I wrestling in my own ambiguity? Are you resting or wrestling? Because let me just tell you right now, nowhere are you called to wrestle. Everywhere you're called to rest. And you can only rest when those promises of God that have come through his word are, are there in your mind and your heart. Rule number five, pray. Prayer is the communication that says, God, open my heart to what I just read. Melt my heart by what I just read. Guard my heart my mind with what I've just read. Lord, I, I want to talk to you. I want to communicate with you, right? I want to know what you want for my life. I want to honor you. You need to know that from my own heart. So prayer is just conversation with God. And then rule number six, is that where we're on right now? Counsel. Listen to people in your life. I can't tell you how this one is glossed over or forgotten. And I think it's, lo- it's glossed over or forgotten because sometimes we want what we want and we know what someone's going to say to us and we'd rather just come across spiritual and say, oh, I prayed about it and I was in the Word, so I, I'm going to make this decision. Never leave out the people of God that are in your life. The person, I'm going to tell you right now, I'm not going to say it's, it's 100%, but I'm going to say it's 99.999%. The person who says, I've prayed about it, and I've, I've spent time in the Word, I'm going to make this decision, nine times out of ten, that decision backfires because they left out the counsel of trusted, godly advisors. You, you don't do that because this covenant don't, doesn't only include you, it includes us. Could I call the church a covenant community? Yes. We're called into covenant together. And I'm going to tell you, in this room, there are, there are hundreds of years of wisdom If we combine all of our wisdom, perhaps even thousands of years of wisdom, I'm not saying some of you are old, I'm saying just some of us have been around a little bit longer than others. Wouldn't it serve us all well if we spent time like, tell me about your journey, share with me your experiences. Hey, can I, can I grab coffee with you? I'm making this decision. You've been around the block a little bit longer than I have. You've been married twice as long as, can I pick your brain because I need some advice and counsel? Ladies and gentlemen, covenant is such a special place to be with one another, right? And, and to be honest with you, in, 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 in covenant community, when we're praying and when we're in the word and, and, and when we're recognizing the enemy, but yet we're just transfixed by uh, the glory of Jesus, you, you don't have to know the will of God when you know the word of God, when it's being preached, when it's being shared, when it's being exchanged with one another, amen? And that's a phrase that has stuck with me for a long time. You don't, know, you don't need to know God's will when you know his word, and you're confident in that. Last point is this, and this is where it gets really, really important. Called for consecration. What does consecration mean? Holy. You're set apart. You're being sanctified. Which, do you, don't seek what God wants you to do if you're not walking a path of holiness. Here's what I'm saying. This is God's will for all of us. As a matter of fact, wouldn't it be cool if there was one spot that just said, for the people of God, here's my will, one word. I got it for you. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 3. Check this out. Paul writes this, for this is the will of God. What? There it is. Your sanctification. There it is. This is a blanket rule for everyone who is in Christ. God's will is for you to walk in holiness. Now, what's interesting is Paul earmarks a specific aspect of our sanctification. And what is that? Our sexuality. Some of you are like, Pastor Scott always has a way to connect it back to sex, doesn't he? 
You want to know why? God, sex is God's idea. It's an amazing thing that he's given to humankind, men and women who are able to experience sex in a procreative way, in a pleasurable way, in a protective way, right? Sex is something that we all share in common, but it's something that we also need to guard ourselves against because there's proper God-honoring sexuality and there's improper not godly sexuality, ungodly sexuality. But this is your... This is God's will, our sanctification. We need to remind one another that paths of holiness are good paths. Because when you don't pursue sanctification, it gets muddy, it's get, it gets blurry, and no one who is impure will see God. That's what the book of Hebrews says. You need to honor God with your time, your treasure, your talents, your mind, your heart, your eyes, your ears, your mouth. What are you watching? What are you listening to? Here's what I'm not going to advocate. I'm not going to advocate that, you know, you, you go ahead and go home and become Amish and throw away all your TVs and all your stereo equipment and all your whatever. You need to be self-controlled enough to say, I know the limits in which my soul can handle. I'll go watch a little Walking Dead later today, but I'll tell you what, I'm going to spend twice as much time as I spent watching Walking Dead in the Word. When you prioritize God and, you, and He sees that in you, He's going to reward that prioritization. What makes me think that God's going to direct my steps for me to understand his heart when I'm not preoccupied with the things that mean something to him? Salvage your time for the glory of God. What you watch on TV, what you listen to, what you read, whatever you fill your time with, wouldn't it be interesting to look at a week and go, boy, I spent 55 hours watching The Crown and I spent 55 seconds in the word. <laughs> Conviction! <laughs> God is not going to bless your life if you're not pursuing holiness. This means in your sexuality. This means in your mentality. This means in what you're hearing, what you're seeing. Honor God, and he's going to honor you. I did a phone check with my kids the other day. D you guys do this with your, with your kids? If you got younger kids. All right, boys, give me your phones. I want to look at your search history anytime. And you know what I told them the other day? I said, you guys can look at my phone too. You can look at my laptop. And my kids are like, well, I, well, <laughs> you know why? Because you're not going to find anything. You're not going to find anything. Why? Because my heart is one that says I want to honor God. By honoring God, he's going to bless my marriage. He's going to bless my kids. He's going to bless business. He's going to bless church. He's going to bless relate. But if I'm hiding these little secret sins, you know, it's going to wear away at my spirit. I'm not going to hear God like I would want to hear God. I'm not going to see God like I need to see God. I'm not going to sense God in, in taking those steps. Holiness is important. Romans chapter 12. I appeal to you, brethren, but, uh, in light by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable. So there's the sanctification part of it, which is your spiritual worship. You worship God not by how loud you sing or how high you raise your hands. You worship God by the holiness you are determined to pursue in your life because he's called you from darkness into light. Do not be conformed to this world. Don't be like your neighbor. Don't be like your, your co-workers, right? Don't be like them. You're going to be different, right? But, and you're going to be transformed by the renewing of your mind that by testing what you may discern, what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. You're not transformed in your mind by Hulu. You're not transformed in your mind by NPR. You're not transformed in your mind by Twitter. You're transformed by the Word of God. And when the Word of God is there, the Spirit of God takes over and changes you into the image of Jesus Christ. That's how you determine the will of God. You make yourself wholly available to Him. So the two final rules, rule number seven, one word. What is it? Calm. Calm. When you're walking in holiness, you don't stress out. When you're living in a manner worthy of your calling in Christ Jesus, there's no anxiety. Because you're reminded, Philippians chapter 4, right? Be anxious for nothing but in everything with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God that transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Isaiah 26. You experience perfect peace when your mind is steadfast on him. Calm. 
Are you resting or wrestling? And the very last word this morning is this. Step. Step. When you don't know what to do, just do what comes next. Take the next logical step of faith. Just move. When, you, when you're walking in holiness and you're in God's word and you're praying and you know you're his kid and nothing could ever separate you from his love, you know what you do? You just step. And it may be a mysterious step, but it's a step nonetheless. It's a step of faith. And God is going to de- be determined to show you why that step was important. It may not show you why you're taking the step. It may be 10 steps down the road, but you're going to look back and go, God was involved every step of my way. And all God's people said, has this been helpful? I try to take this very mysterious topic and let me, let me just close. We did this first service. Um, we got a few minutes. Questions, clarification. Here's one thing I understand. I'm a, I'm a fallible communicator. <laughs> there could be things I said. I'm like, ooh, did I say that? Let me take that back. <laughs> or there's things maybe I didn't say clearly enough. Um, can we interact a little bit? Can we dialogue a little bit together? What questions might you have pertaining to something maybe we covered this morning? Yes. Rich? Yeah. Amen. Yep. Yeah. Can I just say, and I said this for service because my wife was here for service. I, I said, I have come to realize that the voice of God sounds like my wife's voice. <laughs> and, and more and more, it just is like, and let me just tell you, first 10, 15 years of marriage, I resisted that. And then God says, you can learn a lot from her. And so, Rich, you nailed it, brother. So brownie points for you. You're not in the doghouse tonight. That's what I know for sure. Uh, what other thoughts, questions? Anything? Marsha. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Amen. Amen. Yeah. And wherever you may be, thank God for that moment. You know, somehow in his sovereignty, he's allowed you to be where you're at. And if and I wonder when Jesus said, if you're not faithful with the little things, how can I trust you with more? And I wonder if that sense of, you know, this lack of appreciation or this lack of gratitude God says, you're not even happy with this. Why would I want to give you this? Right? Um, That's good. Uh, One or two others. Yeah. Tom? Yeah. 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 Well, you know, the amazing thing is, I think, based upon what we've already talked about today, is we could probably close doors. God in his sovereignty is going to reopen. <laughs> you know, God kind of brings you back like, oh, man. If you don't learn those lessons the first time, there's always sometimes a second lesson God has in store. For some of us, 15, 16 lessons, right? But, yeah, how many times we're humbled when God brings us back to a situation or relationship that we thought we were going to avoid. He says, no, I want you to press into this. Yeah, no, it's good. So, Important things. All good for the glory of God. Walid, you had a question? Okay. Yeah. That would be from 2,000 years ago. So roughly 45, 50 AD. So it's good. If you're interested, I'll send it to you. It's cool, isn't it? Has God been glorified today? Has his spirit had the freedom to work in your hearts and my hearts today? Amen. Let's stand. Let's pray. Father, thanks for this morning. Thank you for this community. Love, love these folks so much. Grateful to journey with them in Christ. Grateful to share 
in the riches of the kingdom of Christ with them. Lord, the things we've talked about today are so, so important for daily living. Lord, my prayer is that you would take all the anxiety and stress, worry, confusion, maybe disappointment away from our hearts. Lord, replace it with the reminder that you're a God who's with us, a God who walks with us, a God who's more intimately involved in our lives than we could ever ask or imagine. We pray like Paul says to the Romans, how unsearchable are your ways. How unfathomable are the ways you work in our lives in this world. But what we do know is that you love us. And what we do know is you've promised us the kingdom. Help us to rest in your sovereignty. Help us to walk paths of holiness. And may our heart's desire be one that wants to share Jesus and share the gospel, share his love with all people. Thanks to God for, to, for today. You're amazing. Thank you for loving us in Christ Jesus. We pray this in his name. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his face towards you and give you his grace and peace forever and ever. Amen.